Life is a series of ups and downs, wins and losses. And sometimes all we can see is what's right in front of us. The next hurdle, the next goal, the next challenge. But there are moments when we realize that our triumphs and our struggles, our victories and our defeats have brought us to this very moment. And it all comes down to this. junior in high school and I was a quarterback of our football team and we were playing in this big game at the end of our season and we were playing the Willersburg Pirates and it was for the conference championship. They were our conference rivals and this game was being built up and it had been raining all day and this is way back before everybody had turf and so it was a mud bowl. And we had these white away jerseys. And so when we were playing, we were just covered in mud. Like you couldn't even see the jerseys. And we were in this dog fight the whole entire game. And as at the end of the game there, we had the ball. It was the final drive of the game. And they were beating us 14 to 7. Drove the ball all the way down the field. We get the ball to their seven-yard line. And it's first and goal. Then it's second and goal. Then it's third and goal. And then it was fourth and goal. The game was on the line. I got to play from the coach, went back into the huddle, and I was like, all right, guys, this is it. This is the moment. Like the conference championship is right here, right now. We're going to go out and win the SOC championship on this play. Called the play, broke the huddle. We had two wide receivers to the right. Took the snap. The inside receiver ran the wrong route, which made me mad. Looked to the outside receiver and he was wide open. I threw the ball and wouldn't you know it, that guy could not catch a cold. He had stone hands. He could not catch the ball. Now, granted, the ball was 10 yards behind him, but still. I mean, come on now. Maybe you can relate to something like that. Now, I'm not talking about throwing a bad pass for, for the conference championship, but I'm talking about maybe you can relate to a moment where you felt like, okay, right here, right now, this is it. We see this all the time in college football. Maybe you caught one of the greatest games that we've seen in years yesterday with Tennessee and Alabama, and it came down, yeah, go Bulls, it came down to the final kick. That's a moment. These moments we have in our lives, we're like, okay, this is it right here, right now. It all comes down to this. Maybe you've put everything you had into a business. And you're like, okay, this is a sink or swim moment right here, right now. Maybe you've taken a new job and it's something that's completely different. Or maybe your, your job has caused you to relocate here to Columbus. And you're like, okay, this is it right here, right now. Or maybe, maybe even you feel like, maybe even you, even you feel like your marriage is in a position where it's like, okay, whatever we decide to do next, this is either going to make it or this is going to break it. See, here's the thing that we all have in common. We all have these moments in our lives where we feel like, okay, this is it right here, right now. It all comes down to this. Let me ask you an honest question. Have you ever felt that way about Jesus? Have you ever been put in a situation where you're like, okay, Jesus, I've prayed for this thing over and over again. I haven't seen any breakthrough. Like, if you really, you really want me to follow you so closely, like, you got to show up in this way. This is the last time I'm praying for this. Have you ever prayed a last prayer? Like, this is the last time I'm praying for this healing. This is the last time I'm praying for this baby. This is the last time I'm praying for my spouse. Or this is the last time I'm praying to find a spouse. Wherever it could be in your life, or you're asking God to show up, you're saying, God, okay, right here, right now. You know, I think of times throughout Scripture where, where Jesus encourages people to keep going because he knows that there's something greater in store ahead. And I think about the time where he called his first disciples. They'd been fishing all night, and they haven't caught anything. 
Cast after cast after cast, their nets have come up empty. And Jesus shows up on the screen and he says, hey, cast your ass out one more time. They're like, Jesus, we've been casting all night. We've caught nothing. He's like, just cast your net out one more time. And they did it once more and they caught a boatload of fish. And then there's another time in Scripture where there was this man with leprosy and he was exiled from the community because of his disease. So he had to live life in isolation, which is the greatest form of punishment. Living life in isolation. He didn't have anybody to talk to, had nobody to share life with. He had no one just to check in and see how the day was going. He had to eat alone. With no chance of civilization, he's exiled from the community. Then he hears that Jesus is coming to town. And he comes to Jesus. And with one last offer, he says, Jesus, could you heal me? And all it took was one touch. And the man was healed. There's another time in Scripture that we read in in, uh, Luke where it says that there's this widow. She had lost her husband prior. And now this widow's at the funeral for her only son. And she's crying, and they're carrying her son out at this funeral. And and it says that Jesus saw her. And I love how it says it's that his heart went out to her. That his heart went out to her, and he said, hey, stop stop crying. Because he knew what was going to happen next. And he went over to the young man. He said, young man, get up. And he got up, and he took him back to his mom. See, There are moments like this in Scripture. Now, what's the commonality of all three of those examples? It's that their lives were forever changed in that moment. Now, think about it. When the disciples, they began to follow Jesus. The man with leprosy got to live in community again. The widow got her son back, and literally the son got his life back. And there's examples of this all throughout the Gospels. When we open up the first four books in the New Testament where it talks about the life and teaching of Jesus, we can see time and time and time again where it seems like everything was over, or it seems like this moment mattered so much that Jesus shows up and he does the miraculous. And here's what happens when we encounter Jesus, our lives are forever changed. Just like those who encounter Jesus in the Gospels, when we encounter the grace of Jesus, our lives are forever changed in that moment. Last week we read in Romans 8.1, it says this, There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that encouraging? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, we are declared free. We are forgiven. And just like the examples of the people in the Gospels who experienced Jesus, when we experience the grace of Jesus, our lives are forever changed. Here's what we know about grace. Grace leads to change. When we understand the totality of grace, it draws us into Jesus just a little bit more closely. We begin to follow him just a little bit more closely. We begin to live more like Jesus. Grace leads to change. And we see this demonstrated throughout the Gospels. We also see it demonstrated in the book of Romans. We're going to be in Romans again here this morning. The first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul takes... He takes time to expound upon grace, what it means and how we get it. And there's three important things that we learn about grace. One, we see that grace is for everyone. Everyone needs grace. See, grace has this unique way of just leveling the playing field. It's like the person you're sitting by right now, they're they're no better than you and you're no better than them because we all need the same thing. And that's the grace of Jesus. Everyone needs it. Everyone can receive it. Two, we see that grace is not earned, grace is given. There's nothing that we can do to earn the grace of God. But it's what Jesus has done on the cross for us. And three, we see this, grace leads to change. When we experience the grace of God, it it draws us into him a little bit more closely. Paul words it this way in Romans 6. He says this in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? After we've experienced grace, what shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Again, when we enter this relationship with Jesus, we are forever changed. We don't keep living the way we used to like we did life without Jesus. See, a lot of people get it confused. 
We don't walk around like we got this, this little card that we can lay and say, I get out of hell free card anytime we want. But we are drawn into a closer relationship with Jesus. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 17 puts it this this way. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone, the new has begun. The old is gone, the new life has begun. There is a change that takes place in the heart. Now, I've known of two reasons. Two reasons why someone will believe in Jesus, yet they won't go all in. See, they'll, they'll believe that Jesus is the Son of God, They'll believe that Jesus died on the cross. They might even believe that Jesus resurrected from the grave and defeated death, but they won't go all in. First reason is this, is because they feel like they've got to get their life together first. They've got to clean up some of their life, clean up some of their sins before they come to Jesus. And I just want to say, uh, false. It doesn't work that way, does it? See, there's nothing that we can do to clean our lives up, but it's what Jesus has done on the cross. And the second reason It's because they're fearful of what we just read. The new has come. What does this new life look like? See, they think a life with Jesus is all about rules. It's all about don't do this and don't do that or do this and do that. They are fearful of what this life with Jesus looks like. It's actually the exact opposite. See, there is more freedom in Jesus than we will ever experience outside of Jesus. When we live life in the world, we are bound to the rules of the world. We are gripped by the culture. The culture has this hold on us and we cannot get free. That's the truth. And Paul explains it. Let's go back to Romans chapter 12. He puts it this way in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now remember, First 11 chapters, he talks about grace. And we get to Romans chapter 12. And it's kind of like the hinge of the door. It begins to shift. It begins to turn a little bit. In Romans 12, verse 1, he writes this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul starts this chapter out by using the word therefore. Here's a little practical tool that someone taught me. is that whenever we see this word therefore in Scripture, we just ask this simple question. Why is therefore therefore? Why is therefore, therefore? And it helps us understand the passage a little bit more. And Paul answers it for us. See, Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of the grace of God, based upon everything that we've just talked about over the last 11 chapters, everything we've talked about, about grace, in view of that, go all in. In view of God's grace, go all in. Give your whole self to Jesus. Go in with both feet. See, some people follow Jesus like they're playing the hokey pokey, don't they? They got one foot in and one foot out. Paul's saying, go all in. In view of God's grace, you got to go in with both feet. And don't conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed. Be changed by the grace of God. See, the pattern of the world is what restricts us. It's what has this grip on us. The culture has this mold that it wants everyone to fit in. And it's going to do everything it can to fit us inside this mold. I got three little kids and they play with Play-Doh all the time. So I think of stuff with Play-Doh that might not be ordinary, but if you got little kids, you might might know exactly what I'm talking about. Here's the thing about Play-Doh. You can make Play-Doh be anything that you want it to be. It's fun to play with, but the thing I hate about Play-Doh, and maybe you'll know this if, if... uh, it's like this color maroon. You got kids. The only thing I hate about Play-Doh is when you open this up and you see like 15 different colors in there. You're like, come on now. You just ruined it. You ruined the Play-Doh. But here's the thing. You can make Play-Doh be anything you want it to be. You can form Play-Doh and you can mold it and, and you can turn it into anything that you want it to be. And when I think about that, I think about what the culture often does to us. See, the culture often makes this mold that it wants us to fit in. 
that says, okay, this is what, this is what it means to live within our, our, our culture. This is the way you got to think. This is the way you got to live. We got to mold you and fit you into this. This is, this is how you got to look. This is the image you need to portray. And they try to put us into this little mold and say, okay, that's it right there. This is what, a, this is what it means to be a man in our culture. This is what it means to be a, a, a woman in our culture. And it tries to fit us within this mold. And when we live life without Jesus, we're stuck to it. We're gripped by it. It's this mold, this grip that the culture has on us and it causes us to try to fit in. Here's the thing about the mold too is that we do everything we can oftentimes. We do everything we can to fit within the mold that the culture tries to put us in. And the mold changes, doesn't it? The mold changes. They'll go week to week and the mold will change. And here's the thing. What the culture tries to fit us in right now, that might be something different next week. And so we spend everything that we have, all the pressure that we have inside of us to fit within the mold of the culture. And this thinking thing will change next week. And what happens is it leads to unsatisfied lives because we're always chasing something we can never grasp. And the culture puts on this illusion of satisfaction. But only in Jesus will we be able to break free from this. Only Jesus can break the mold and then we don't conform. We don't conform to the mold that the culture tries to put us in. And I love how Paul says this. He says, don't conform to the patterns of the world. Don't be restricted to this mold. And he says, once we break out of that, once we break out of that, we will be able to understand the will of God. Have you ever wanted to know what God's will is for your life? I mean, what a great question that is. A lot of times we spend our whole lives wondering, what is it that God has, has willed for me? What is it that God has called me to, to do? What is, who has God called me to be? And yet we're still stuck within the mold of the culture. Paul says when we break out of that and we don't conform, then we will understand what it means. The culture might say, this is what it means to be a man. And God says, this is the man I've called you to be. The culture might say, this is what it means to be a woman. But God will say, this is the woman that I've called you to be. See, only Jesus can bring us freedom. So my friend, if, if you think our life with Jesus is all about rules, all about do's and don'ts, please do not be ill-informed. But it's the culture that has its rules set on you. Jesus brings freedom from that. And with that freedom comes peace. Here's the bottom line. Jesus breaks the mold of conformity. Only he can do that. He breaks the mold of conformity. And in the book that we've been using to kind of help us outline this year, the Core 52 book, Mark Moore talks about some practical ways that we can break this mold of conformity, that we can, we can, we can jump into it. I want to highlight two of those. One of those is this, to engage the Bible. To engage the Bible. Engaging with the Bible helps us see a broader picture. Remember what Paul wrote there in Romans 12 too, that it takes a renewing of our mind. A renewing of our mind. When we engage with the word of God, it helps us see things a little bit differently. It gives us a broader picture on life. See, people who live by, by the, the world standards are focused on the here and now. They're not focused on what lasts. But engaging with the word of God helps us begin to think differently. And Paul says, hey, this is, this is where it kind of begins. We, be, we need to think differently. We need to renew our minds. And that takes place by engaging in the word of God. And two, engage in community. We cannot do life alone. We need other people to help us walk along this journey with Jesus together. You know, the vision of our church is to follow Jesus together. The greatest decision that we believe someone can make on this side of eternity is to follow Jesus. And the best way to do that is together. That's why we want to follow Jesus together. And anything and everything we do, and that together piece, is, it means together. To live life in community. Now, I know saying those things, engage the Bible and engage community, probably sound like a broken record, don't they? We say those things a lot. But they are vital. They are vital you know, people struggle 
to break the grip the culture has put on, on them. And a large part of that is because they've neglected those two things. They've neglected reading the Bible, engaging with the Bible, and living life in community with other people who are following Jesus. And some people are chasing an image that is pressed upon them by the culture, and they are just suffocating, suffocating, trying to keep up. You know, when someone makes a decision to go all in with Jesus here at the church, we try to emphasize this so much. Maybe you've seen someone be baptized here. They, they're baptized in these shirts that, that say changed on them. And the reason we, we chose these shirts to say changed on it because that's what Jesus offers. Jesus offers a life that's different than the norm. So when someone wants to go all in with Jesus, to go all in with both feet, when they are baptized, they, they're baptized in this shirt, and they get to keep this shirt as a marker, as a moment marker for them as when they went all in with Jesus. But we see this. Jesus offers a life that's different than the norm. See, chasing the culture is sin. Jesus brings freedom from that. And with freedom comes peace. Knowing that we don't have to live that way where we are bound by what other people try to, try to tell us how to think and how to live. But we're free in Jesus. So we, we have this changed shirt. If uh, we have here coming up in a few weeks, we have what we call Decision Sundays. Anybody can go all in with Jesus. Anybody can be baptized at any time throughout the year. They can be baptized today. But there are a few Sundays that we circle on the calendar year to help spark conversations. That way, if someone's thinking about what it means to go all in with Jesus, they can know, hey, we're having some Sundays coming up where we're highlighting this, and we can have those conversations. If you would like to know what it means to go all in and follow Jesus, what it what it means to experience the grace of God and how the grace leads to change. We'd love to have that conversation with you. You can come down at the end of our service here. You can go to Guest Central, talk with some amazing people there about what it means to, to follow Jesus. Perhaps you've maybe thought, okay, I've, I've done this before. I've, I've gone all in with Jesus before, but I've kind of slowly drifted. And now I find myself focusing and, and living by, by this pattern of the world that I need to break away from. We'd love to have that conversation with you as well. Once you know this, when someone is baptized, the T-shirt is just something that, that can be a reminder. But we also want to help make sure that there's resources available. When someone's baptized here at the church, they get what we call a changed, uh, a changed study. There's this four-session guide that we give to people that are baptized. It walks through what it means to live in this changed life. It's a great little accompaniment to their first month of journey of following Jesus. And there's some awesome videos that go along with it. But once you know, there's resources out there to help. Because Jesus does offer change. And church, it is a great change. It is life-giving. Unlike so many things in the culture which are life-draining, Jesus following him is life-giving. This morning, as we conclude, we're going to jump right back into Romans 12, 1 and 2. We're going to read those verses again, and we're going to look at them this time from a different version. We're going to read them from the message paraphrase. It's a, it's a paraphrase of the Bible, but I think the way that it's worded here really sums up what Paul is saying and what we're talking about here this morning. So as we read this from Romans 12, let's kind of, let's take these words in and, and really just read them slowly and meditate on the Word of God. Romans 12, verses 1 says this. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Let me read that again. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-informed maturity in you. Church, this is our, this is our moment. This is our, it all comes down to this moment. 
See, we all have to face this. We all have to, we all have to face this question head on. Are we allowing the world to shape us? Or are we allowing the grace of God to change us? Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who went to the cross and on the cross brought freedom for us to be able to break out of this mold where we feel like we have to follow the pattern of the world. And Jesus says, no, here I can break you free from that and also help you live within the will of the person I've called you to be. And Lord, what a blessing that is. I'm going to pray a bold prayer. Maybe there's some people out here right now that think following Jesus is all about rules. And so they've been hesitant to go all in. Help them to see the reverse, that following Jesus is actually freedom. And living life by the world is what's bound by rules. Lord, we thank you so much for the grace of God that leads us to follow you just a little bit more closely. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.